Coming up on this week's show, why Super Mario Maker has been needed since the 80s. Our N64 and GameCube games coming to the Switch. And we get the untold story at the dawn of cyberculture and online gaming. We talk Plato with Brian Deer. <laughs> Hello and welcome to the Retro Hour podcast, episode number 181, your weekly dose of retro gaming and technology news with me, Dan Wood. And me, Joe Fox. Now, Ravi's still on his travels this week. That means me and you again, Joe, are going to be talking about the retro gaming stories that have happened over the last week. More Nintendo stories to talk about this week. More Nintendo stories. I'm I'm loving it up. I'm just sighing, rubbing my hands together. I'm like, oh. Yes, Nintendo's in the news again. <laughs> Ooh, rubbing your knees. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, this week we are going to talk about something that um, I, I haven't seen much about this. Now, we, we've often talked about a kind of history, you know, personal history with games. Mm-hmm. I mean, you're more of a console guy growing up. Absolutely. Um, yeah, I love consoles as well, but my background was a bit more in computers. Yeah. And my parents, I mean, my mum and dad worked in computers in the 70s. They're both programmers, weren't they? My mum is, yeah, well, she yeah. was. Yeah. And retired now. And my dad, I mean... We kind of say my mum used to program them, my dad used to build them. Yeah. Okay. Um, he was a circuit board designer. My mum operated mainframe computers oh, okay. back in the 70s. So you're talking like these um, massive machines that probably filled up like double the size of the room we're in now. Yeah. And probably had less calculation power than a pocket calculator today. Amazing. And she used to, you know, everything was loaded enough like punch cards yeah. and flipping switches and that kind yeah. of thing. Don't, didn't have displays or um, that kind of thing. Here, my mum still asks me to set her up a new email address whenever yep. she gets a new computer because <laughs> the internet exists within that computer. Um, worlds <laughs> apart. <laughs> Actually, a cousin of mine said to me recently, um, said, oh, yeah, I haven't got the internet on my phone. She's on Facebook. I'm on Facebook. Yeah, that's, I'm on Facebook. That's not the internet. So, yeah, there, there is a lot yeah. of that out there, I think. There is today. a lot of that still out there. <laughs> Interesting. Yeah, so today, though, we are going to be talking about something that, if I told you, the system we're covering today started in 1960 and had its peak probably in the mid to late 70s. Mm. So we're going way back before both of us were born. Yeah. Um, way back in the day. And it's um, a system that had a lot of stuff that we take for granted today. This was called Plato. Now, let me tell you a few of the things that people were doing on Plato back in the 60s and 70s. What about online chat rooms? That blew my mind when you told me that. In the 60s, chat rooms, putting swear words across the computers. <laughs> and this was real time. Yeah. This was real time. Online dating. People were doing that on it. Okay. It had online gaming. Of course, Plato was an online system. Pretty much every game on it was made for multiplayer. Okay. So you probably had the, the reckon the first multi-user dungeon game yeah. was founded on Plato. The first graphical first-person shooter in the 1970s on Plato. It had stuff on there as well, like uh, you know people go on there and write news articles. And it had online newspapers in, yeah. in the 1970s. And this was big in, the, in universities. This was mainly used, wasn't it? Well, this was a system, yeah. I mean, it kind of, I think it actually predated the, you know, we always talk about the ARPANET, yeah. which is what the modern day internet grew out of. Mm-hmm. And that was um, originally a military project. Mm-hmm. But Plato was invented as an educational tool okay. um, until kind of all these users got their hands on it. Yeah. Because it was mainly in high schools and it was universities and colleges. And it was a lot of teenage users, people in their early 20s, yeah. who suddenly discovered they had this kind of big ecosystem. This, like, like I said before, the dawn of cyber culture. Yeah. And they eventually took over this system mm. and started making stuff like online gaming and chat rooms. And mm. really it was, you know, the stuff that the rest of us did probably in, you know, from the late 90s onwards. These guys were doing in the 60s and 70s. That's... Pretty mind blowing, actually, because you think you don't think like you always hear these stories about oh yeah, the internet was made yeah. in the sixties and the seventies and stuff, and you always just think yeah, but it didn't do anything, did it? We didn't do anything until, with it until the late eighties, the early nineties. But that's quite fascinating to hear that actually we did have all these things in real time as early as, and this was created in 1962. nineteen sixty two. In nineteen sixty two, I think was a release of it. Okay. Yeah, so it started in nineteen sixty, but it also had um, multi touch touch screen. It had a flat screen plasma display. So plasma display was invented for Plato. Okay. And you remember when the iPhone launched? Yeah. I mean, the iPhone recently celebrated its 10th anniversary. Yeah. And I still remember, you know, you can watch it on YouTube. Steve Jobs doing the introduction when he demoed that multi-touch on the mm. screen. He's like, you know, do we want to use a stylus? Or who wants that? We're going to use a finger. And everyone thought it was so revolutionary. Plato did that 30 years earlier. Yeah. Figured out that the finger was the best tool to... Yeah, not even 30 years, you know, 40 years, yeah. really, yeah. yeah. Like, you know, so far in advance yeah. of everything else. But the criminal thing is that this system is mostly forgotten. Mm. No I've never heard talking. of it. Yeah, I mean, I've been at computers all my life. I hadn't heard of it till recently. Yeah. And it really hadn't been documented. So today we're going to be joined by a really interesting guy called Brian Deer 
who's written a book called The Friendly Orange Glow. Because Plato it had graphics, but all the, the the screens were like those amber displays. Oh, okay. So he talks about you know looking in through like you know kind of like <laughs> there's rooms there. One room called the zoo that he talks about in his book, where the university students would go in probably about midnight, mm. and they could stay there overnight while you know the the computers weren't busy, mm. and they lock themselves in. They go for breakfast out you know about eight in the morning when yeah. the rest of the team came in to do actual work on it. But he said he'd look through and you'd just see like an amber glow and all these like, you know, geeks playing online games at like, you know, <laughs> two in the morning. So sounds amazing. So we're going to get the story, the untold story of Plato with this week's special guest, Brian Deere. I think you're going to find this one really interesting and stuff that you've never heard about before. Really good. And his, his book's actually available on Amazon, so I'll put a link in the show notes to that. And we're also going to talk about some really interesting stuff like Infocom and um, Mario Maker as well that I've just picked up. Mario Maker 2 on the Nintendo Switch. I've not played it. Joe, I don't, well, I've not got a switch. <laughs> but I'll buy you a switch. I mean, buy me a switch. I didn't say that. <laughs> <laughs> before we get into that, though, I mean, proving that I haven't got any money, we actually do need donations to keep the show we going. Go. <laughs> Just saying. So, um, I mean, doing a weekly podcast, it does come with its expenses, and anything we do get in doesn't go to buying Joe a switch. I do promise. It all goes back into the running of this podcast. So, if you'd like to support us and keep the retro hour podcast going every week. I mean, now we're uh, three and a half years we've been doing the show That's every crazy. single week. That is crazy. Hasn't missed an episode. We've done a lot in those three and a half years as well. The fact that we can keep doing it this long is really thanks to you guys uh, helping us out with the running of the show. Now, if you would like to support the podcast, you can make a little donation of any amount, and all of it, 100%, will go back into the running of the show, help pay for our expenses, um, studio time, hosting, all that kind of thing, website hosting. So if you'd like to make a donation via PayPal, you'll find the link on the supporters section of theretrohour.com, or you can do it direct from your app. It is paypal at theretrohour.com. And any amount will earn you a shout in a future episode on the Hall of Fame. Just like this week, Jean Runard Guthier, Brian Darling, Andrew Ellis, and Gareth McKee, who all made donations into the running of the show. And if you'd like to do the same, please do. You'll find it at theretrohour.com. Now, we're talking about Super Mario Maker there. I mean, I love the original on the, the Wii U. Did, did You've got a Wii U. I had it for the Wii U, okay. yeah. yeah. I, I actually got my Wii U as, like, Mario Maker came out, like the death of the Wii U, you know. Yeah. It was the end of the Wii U. I got a good deal on it. And I really enjoyed Mario Maker. But there was just, like, certain things where I was just like, I wish it had this and I wish it had that. Um, and I can't think of the top of my head, but I'm sure these, like, these things are now going to be in Mario Maker 2 because there was so much to do in Mario Maker. And then Mario Maker 2 came and I was a bit like, well, how can you top that? And then the more I think about it, I was more like, oh, actually, you know, it was it was, it was, was missing this and it was missing well, On my that. multiplayer was one big thing. Yeah, Yeah, that absolutely. is now in Mario Maker 2. Yeah. Um, and it's already, I mean, you know, it, it's already become, like, number one in the sales charts this yeah. week, as, as you'd expect, I think, overall in games. Mm. Um, but there is an interesting article I was reading on The Verge, and they're talking to um, a guy called Takashi Tezuka, who was um, one of the producers, he was the assistant director on the very first Super Mario Brothers game um, nice. back in the mid-80s. And he talks about the process of designing levels on that first NES game. Yeah. And he said how laborious it was and how long it took them. So, I mean, you know, you think today the amount of tools that we have, yeah, we kind of take it for granted. I mean, he talks about the fact that what they'd have to do to make a Mario level in the first game, they'd have to sketch out the entire thing on graph paper. I've seen the, I've seen the pictures of it, and it's like all around the boardroom, going around the walls, you know, and they've got this long, and it just looks amazing, but yeah. it's all hand-drawn. It's like a storyboard. And, and now, how long was that taken? How, yeah, exactly. <laughs> it's taken them days and days to do that, just to plan it out before they even start thinking about programming it and stuff yeah and then after that you'd have to take it you know to another department mm -hmm. um, explain it to the programmer yeah give him the graph paper you'd have to translate it into machine code get it yeah. into the game i mean it was a really long process and he actually says that what he always wanted back then was something like mario maker he envisioned this back in like the mid 80s just something yeah you could just drag and drop it and just go i want that there i want this here yeah. like which, you know, makes complete sense. And apparently they did, as kind of, you know, the, the later Mario games kind of came along. They actually came up with Mario Maker as an internal Nintendo project. Yeah. To make levels for, for Mario. Yeah. Um, and then I think someone actually saw it and said, actually, this is actually loads of fun. We should put it out as a game. Yeah. And that's kind of the story of how Mario Maker developed. I would imagine by the time they kind of got to the SNES, the 16-bit kind of era, they would have had some sort of way of just kind of like, not necessarily dragging and dropping, but just kind of going, right, we put that there. Okay, we want this sprite, so we just chuck back there. Do you know what I mean? Yeah, and, yeah. You know, More I copy and paste kind of thing. Yeah, I would imagine that started to happen. And like you say... People probably started having fun with it. Yeah. You know, and then especially 
you know, as they start kind of like as retro became really popular again, like you say, somebody's just looked at it and gone, we can market this. We've got a gold mine here. <laughs> well, it, I mean, it's, an, it's a game that is, what I think is genius about it is there's unlimited replay value yeah because you can always make new levels and you can always play other people's levels it and... depends how imaginative you are <laughs> i always make mine way too hard we, <laughs> uh, me and the wife we got we got when we got it we got into a habit of like if one of us was at work the other would be at home not like doing you know doing the housework or anything making levels <laughs> like and like i was getting excited to come home to the levels my wife had made me they were never that hard bless her <laughs> and then i would make it like the super difficult levels and watch her struggle and not even get two seconds into to then be like, well, give it here, let me play it, like kind of thing. Joe, you haven't eaten for a week. Get off Mario Maker. <laughs> so, um, you know, I think this may be the time for me to get the Switch and start playing this and uh, live out the dreams of, how do we say his name, of, uh, t- is it Tezuka? T- oh, your guess is as good as mine. Tezuka. Yeah. <laughs> start living out his dreams in the 80s of having a Mario Maker. <laughs> yeah, I mean, it, it is a wonderful platform anyway the switch for games like that and the only thing i find is you know with the wii u because you had a separate touchscreen controller yeah when your switch is docked and you're playing it on the tv so I, i've got the game i haven't opened it up to play it yet but i'm that. wondering now is that, is that going to work too well or yeah you have to kind of it'd, do it with be, a it'd be fine on the yeah, handheld on the handheld but yeah when it's docked yeah, yeah. that's a good point yeah, I've got it. It's still in the shrink wrap. I haven't opened it yet. You'll have so, to let us know next that's, week. That's my job this weekend. That's your yeah. job this weekend. <laughs> now, there is something amazing that I've just been looking through. The reason I probably haven't played um, Super Mario Maker 2 is because I've been looking through the uh, the archives of the Infocom cabinet. Okay. Now, Infocom were a legendary company back in the 70s and 80s for text adventure games. And they did stuff like uh, the Zork series, uh, Planetfall, and one of my favourite text adventure games, Hitchhiker's Guide to the Galaxy. Mm-hmm. Now, this is a game that Infocom released in the mid-80s on loads of platforms. And um, Douglas Adams, the guy behind Hitchhiker's Guide, was involved in it. And a guy called um, Steve Moretzky. But now, it turns out that Steve actually saved a hell of a lot of stuff okay. from Infocom. And he's essentially got the contents of all their filing cabinets. It's literally just scanned in as well, isn't it? Yeah. He's just gone through it all, kind of like article by article. And... You know, I wouldn't be surprised if you're just going to find like some accounting like receipts here <laughs> or something like that. Well, the one that really caught my attention is, you know, it's the first one. It's on archive.org and the whole collection, you can browse through it, all of their PDF files. The Hitchhiker's Guide to the Galaxy one. And now you think about this. It was a text adventure game that fit on a single floppy disk. Yeah. I don't think it even filled like, you know, a quarter of the disk. It was probably about 200 kilobytes or something. Okay. You're thinking, well, you know, the design documents for that can't be that big. 590 pages long wow. of A4. Yeah. And you're looking through it, and what is fascinating is it's got different, you know, you look at the first page, and it's all the dates of the compilations of different revisions of the game. Yeah. And they're all written, you know, the date that it was done, what number of revision it is, how many bytes it is, how many objects and stuff are in there too. And a lot of this is handwritten. I was going to say, I'm just flicking through it now, and I got to page 24 or something like that before... <laughs> It actually became, and uh, now I've, I've just flipping through it and it's become handwritten yeah. again. So that, that's pretty amazing that he's kept all of that. And you're looking through and there's a v- vocabulary in the game and they're yeah. talking about like all the different design decisions. What is interesting about this is it is a real snapshot of game development in the mid 80s. Yeah. And when it was, I mean, we were talking about Mario a minute ago, that graph paper thing. This is essentially the text adventure version of that. Yeah. You know, the whole thing's written down in Biro, which it's, is like it nuts. Is. You know, we've got newspaper clip- clippings in here and photocopies, you know, of books and stuff like that. Pages and pages and pages and pages of it. And, you know, I, I imagine if you're a real super fan of something like, you know, Hitchhiker because Guide of the Galaxy, this is like a real, you know, treasure trove of just like information just to sit there and look through at night. You know what I mean? I can imagine that being people just going, being absolutely amazed by this because I'm looking at it and it's just like, it's not something I'm massive on, but this is mm. it's pretty damn cool. Yeah, and that game was brutally hard as well. Yeah. You'd do something that was just, you know, completely logical and you'd die for the stupidest reason. <laughs> you'd always laugh, but you'd be like, oh, damn, you know, if you didn't save the game. Yeah. But also, I mean, at the end of this, there's like a section where they've got, um, they've given it to people to play the game and they've got yeah. feedback off them. Oh, to really? To see what they think. So you can see like the, the feedback notes from playtesting and things. So it's really interesting. Like I said, I mean, I was going through it this morning. Didn't look at how many pages it was, and I was like, I've been looking about an hour and a half, and I thought, must be near the end of this now. No, still still another like 500 pages to go. So it's um, so much on there, and anyone that was a fan of... Yeah, I mean, if you're a fan of those text adventure games, or just want to get a little snapshot of how games used to be made back Mm. in our day, uh, you can check that out right now in our show notes at theretrohour.com.
Now, we're talking about the Switch before, and one thing I think you'll probably do, Joe, if you do eventually get your hands on the Switch, is play a few old NES games. Yeah. There's a lot of them on there, and every week you go on. I don't know if you, have you actually seen the, the NES library on the Switch before? Right at the start, okay. you know, when you first... When you first got the Switch and you were bringing it over and showing it to me and we had it on the train and in the car and stuff like that. Yeah. You know, looking at the, the library. But from what I understand, it's pretty big now. Every week you go on and there's normally like another four or five on there. Yeah. And they've been doing that for must be God, about a year now probably. Yeah, yeah. And as much as I do like the NES, it was probably the Nintendo console that I played least. Yeah. Because I never owned one as a kid. I, I knew one guy that kind of had one, but it was really when... You know, the Super Nintendo came along the N64. Yeah, my friends I'm, I'm the same as well. You know, for me, it's the SNES and the N64. Yeah. But they've recently announced that they're going to be bringing a whole load of N64 and GameCube games to the Switch. Well, that's the interpretation of this announcement. Yeah. Now, there is a website. This is, I mean, it's been all over the news mm-hmm. over the last week. It's, it's really, the source of it is a website called JapaneseNintendo.com. And it came from the 79th, it's how long Nintendo's been going, okay. 79th annual general meeting of shareholders that happened at the end of June. Okay. Now, apparently someone in this meeting, one of the shareholders has said, you know, well, when can we expect a bit more content on the Switch from other consoles like the N64 and the GameCube? Yeah. And they replied with, this is the, the translation okay. of the quote. So, I mean, there could be mistakes and <laughs> misinterpretation here. So the response from Nintendo was, at this place, we cannot tell new information about future classic hardware, among others, but we are thinking about providing an extension of the online service, which is currently providing Famicom, NES software, as well as other methods of providing them. We also recognise there are opinions wanting to play past titles. So that does sound like the... I mean, I, I, I can't really think of any other interpretation of that than the are looking at other systems. Yeah, okay. I don't know why they've come out with N64 I got well excited. I'm like, it's coming out. It's coming. <laughs> it's got to, though, hasn't it? It's got to. I mean, the GameCube needs some love. Come on, man. What a system. Come on, man. Come on, Nintendo. <laughs> <laughs> come but on, it, Mr. Nintendo. But there's so much opportunity there. You know, people, they want to play Mario Sunshine. They want to play uh, Luigi's Mansion. You know, we got some re-releases of some of the Zelda games and yeah. stuff on the Wii U. But let's get them on the handheld. Let's get them on the go. You know, that would blow my, like, 12-year-old mind, my 12-year-old mind, to be able to sit there on the go playing these games in such nice graphics and stuff on the Switch to actually sit there and play Mario Sunshine, Wave Race, and stuff like that. And even some of the N64 games, yeah. you know, we got a lot of those, some kind of N64 interpretations on the DS and stuff like that. But to actually play the original, do you know what I mean? You yeah, and especially when you put it on your TV as well, you know. There's some games yeah. out there which really need some love. Yeah. And they need the Switch. And, and you know the Switch could support it easily. I mean, yeah. we, we had the virtual console on the Wii U that was yeah. one of the most loved features about the Wii U. And it mm. kind of, it's blown my mind that the Switch has been out two years now and they still haven't put anything like that in there. Yeah, it's like, that's a bit strange. It's got to be coming. And like that's the thing that fans are crying out for yeah. as well. It's like, because it's weird because the Switch, I've not seen any breakdown of the demographic. Mm-hmm. But I imagine there's a lot of, I mean, my, my nephew Harry, he's five years old, he loves the Switch, he's on yeah. it all the time. And the NES doesn't mean anything to him. No. I mean, but then again, neither does the N64 or the Super Nintendo. Yeah, but I true. think those games are probably, they are more relatable to him. But you've got to think as well, <clears throat> the people who, those players who grew up with the N64 and the GameCube now, they're now coming to that age where yeah. they've got children, yeah. and five-year-olds and stuff. I would love to be able to show uh, my children in the future GameCube games on the go and stuff like that as well. Like, I think that's, it's a, it's a, it's a market. It's something they're missing. But, Potentially, yeah, sounds like it might be coming. Maybe they're going to do the mini console. So that a lot of people are saying the yeah. reason they don't want to do this is because they want you to buy the mini console as well. But yeah. I think real Nintendo fans will just get both anyway. Yeah, this is, I'll yeah. get both. Yeah, exactly, yeah. <laughs> so it's, I, I think it, it makes sense to do it. And they probably have got it running. Yeah. yeah. Just yeah, just need to get it out there. Yeah, I think. So true. Come on, Nintendo. Stop taking down fan games and release actual good games on your systems that we want to play from back in the day. <laughs> Rant over. Rant over. Right, well, thank you for checking out the news this week. I'll put everything we talked about in our show notes at theretrohour.com. Um, of course, the podcast comes out every Friday. If you would like to leave a review on your favourite podcast service of choice um, or a comment or a five-star rating, that always really helps the show. Uh, tag your mates in our social media profiles. We are at Retro Hour UK on Twitter, Instagram and Facebook. And get us on all your favourite social media platforms. Anyway, can help get the show in front of new people. It's always massively appreciated. And now, let's get the story, the untold story of a truly groundbreaking system. The precursor to pretty much everything we do online these days, I think, pretty much. We're going to talk about Plato with the author of The Friendly Orange Glow, Brian Deer. 
You're listening to the Retro Hour podcast and it is time to welcome on this week's very special guest, the author of one of the most interesting books that I've read in recent years. I honestly could not put this book down. And the story of a system called Plato. And this book is called The Friendly Orange Glow. Now, the tagline that you use in the book is the untold story of the Plato system and the dawn of cyberculture. Now, the things that were happening on Plato back in the 1960s are going to blow your mind. So to talk about it, let's welcome to the show the author of the book. Welcome to the Retro Hour, Brian Deer. Thanks for having me. Now, let's just quickly summarize. I mean, obviously, we'll get a bit more into the details of exactly what Plato was and what it did and um, your experiences with it. But can you give us a, a quick summary for people that might not be familiar with it? What was the Plato system? So uh, the Plato system was uh, built starting in 1960 at the University of Illinois, Champaign, Ur- uh, Urbana-Champaign, Illinois. And um, the purpose, the mission of the project was to see if you could use a computer to teach a student instead of having a teacher. And you have to understand, in 1960, there were very few computers in the world, and that that did not uh, scare off the, the leader of the project, uh, uh, Don Bitzer, who at the time was 26 years old and had just gotten a PhD um, in electrical engineering. So the, the idea was that you know, could you put a student in front of a computer with a with a screen, with a graphics display, uh, a very interactive experience? And remember, this is 1960, yeah. and most of that technology did not exist. So that did that again did not scare them. So they went ahead, and uh, it was a very scrappy project with very low budget, and um, found a broken used television. Uh, legendarily it was in an alley somewhere they bought it for 10 bucks off somebody um the tuner didn't work but the video worked and the screen worked and they 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 hooked it up to a uh raytheon storage tube which was a cathode ray tube for storing digital data and you could digitize video um send in digital data and draw uh, display, including text and graphics, in, into the storage tube, and then that, and then output that into a television display. And so the idea was, eventually, they'd figure out how to make real computer terminals. But this was the test. And the interesting thing about Plato is that it kept uh, going as a project all through the '60s, and the ambitions were enormous. The idea was to build a whole network of terminals, hopefully hundreds, and then thousands, and then ultimately millions. Um, all connected to essentially supercomputers. By the 1970s, the University of Illinois was up to Plato version four, Roman numeral four. And that's where all the interesting stuff happened. And the majority of my book is about what happened with Plato four. Probably the most notable thing that I, you know, I spend the most of the time in the book about is the fact that the Plato system initially had this mission of being purely educational, but the the great irony of of the story is that the the very students who were exposed to Plato discovered that this was an amazing platform for not just education but but for fun. It turned out to be a fantastic platform for developing games and interactive social applications. And so, starting around 1972 or so, you start seeing the beginnings of the, the, the very students at the University of Illinois and local high schools in Champaign-Urbana, Illinois, realizing that, you know, uh, you could actually develop your own stuff on this system and share it with others. And within a few months, you start seeing chat rooms and, and instant messaging and uh, message forums, message boards and all that kind of stuff. And, of course, multiplayer interactive games. Um, you know, the likes of which had never been seen before. And, you know, it might help to just quickly describe the um, what the hardware looked like, yeah. what people were using circa 1972, because that, that too was insanely futuristic. Um, the Plato terminal in 1972 had 512 by 512 graphics. Um, it had a built-in touchscreen. And it was a flat panel gas plasma display. The, the plasma display was invented in the world for the Plato project. That's where plasma televisions come from and all that. Um, 
And they did that through all kinds of electrical engineering magic, which I describe at length in the book. And it's a, a wild story. It took years for them to figure out how to do it. It was, you know, trial and error. It's, and, it's incredible to me because my mum was a, a computer mainframe operator in the 1970s. Uh -huh. uh, you know, circa like 1975, she was still using, you know, it was um, punch cards and switches. Right. And you're talking then about the fact that Plato had touch screens. And I mean, it, today it we're, we're all used to it now on phones, but that was way ahead of the curve. It, it was so, it, it, and, and what's, what's also interesting, and you see this throughout the Plato story, is that um, they would invent stuff and then they'd realize that it's too expensive uh, to deploy this uh, to actual users, to, to actually build this and get it out to the world would cost too much money because um, uh, for a variety of technical reasons, but mainly just because stuff was way too expensive. So, um, for example, when they invented touch uh, on the touch screen, they also invented multi-touch. They, in other words, multiple fingers touching and doing gestures and stuff like that. They knew all about that stuff. This is, you know, circa 1970, 71, 72, when they were designing the touch screen. But then they realized that that's going to require too much smarts in the terminal, which and these were essentially dumb terminals uh, without, you know, m much of a or really a, a, a local processor on the scale of a PC or something that would come in a few years. But, uh, you know, the, the Apple much, much later on, you know, in the in the 2000s, when they started putting touch into uh, the iPad and the iPhone, they had the luxury of it's all local. So it's not going over phone lines or, or even the Internet or anything. It's all in the device. And they had the advantage of, of years and years of Moore's Law bringing the price of CPUs and chips and memory and all that stuff down and the, the shrinkage of to nano scale in terms of uh, chip design and everything. That stuff didn't exist yet when Plato was was uh, happening. And so they couldn't do all the fancy touch that they wanted to do. Um, all, all they could wind up with was basically you could use one finger and touch somewhere on the screen and it would register as an input back on the, the system and, you know, whatever your program is doing, you know, would respond accordingly. But it was remarkable that, um, you know, they decided to go the touch route uh, because they were having lots of debates with the team at Xerox Park, Alan Kay and all those guys, right at the same time. And um, they had big arguments about whether they should use touch or a mouse. And Alan Kay and company at Xerox insisted that a mouse was the right way to go. And the Plato team said, no, we don't think so, because, you know, we want to be able to have even kindergarten students be able to sit in front of this terminal and interact with it um, without any effort and just learn it right away. And there's no more simple human interface than reaching out and touching something with your finger. And it's really interesting because Steve Jobs used exactly that argument in the famous 2007 video that you can see on YouTube, you know, the, the famous introduction of the iPhone yes. to the world, you know, he was saying like, you know, it, 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 almost word for word, the same phrases. And it's, it's interesting that, you know, Jobs, of course, had embraced the mouse because he saw the mouse at Xerox Park in 1979. And, you know, the Macintosh came with the mouse and the Lisa came with the mouse and everything since has come with the mouse. And they went the, the, the gooey approach that graphical user interface design approach that Xerox Park had pushed for. And uh, it would take so many decades for the world to basically embrace touch. But it was inherent in the Plato system from, you know, 1972 on. Well, let's talk about your personal experiences with Plato. How did you discover it and what impressed you most about it when you saw the system? When I was doing, you know, uh, looking at going around the East Coast of the United States, looking at colleges, um, I think I was a junior in high school and I went and looked at various colleges and everything. One of the ones I went to was the University of Delaware. And um, I remember walking through the music building because I'm, I'm always very interested in music, even to this day. And uh, I remember seeing, you know, all the typical classrooms and you'd hear all the the noise in a music building because every single classroom has a piano or some other instrument and some somebody's rehearsing or there's a class or some professor, 
you know, there's a, uh, someone's taking a lesson or something like that. So you hear all these random instruments and I walk by, I was just walking the halls and I see this one classroom that, you know, how a lot of university classrooms will have a door that's mostly wooden, but then it has a sort of a vertical window in it and you can look into the class. And I noticed that um, the, the lights were off in that this one classroom, except I could see all these orange displays in there. And I was like, it looked, you know, just glancing at it as I was walking by, it looked like, you know, an air traffic control center or something like that with these people sitting around and they were all wearing headphones and they were all reaching out and touching these screens with these high resolution at the time, you know, high resolution computer displays with gorgeous graphics on them. I mean, they, a lot of them had uh, musical, you know, uh, piano keyboards displayed on the screen and they were reaching out and touching the notes and they were lighting up as you played them. And, and with the headphones, it was like, they're actually doing music. And then you could see uh, musical notation that was just gorgeous. You know, everything is orange. All the pixels are orange. The background is black. And I didn't know what this was. And I wouldn't know because I was, you know, uh, until a year or so later when I actually wound up going to the University of Illinois. And I went back to that music building and I went in that classroom and I discovered, you know, there was there was sort of a, uh, a large poster on the wall and, and it was all written with magic marker and it said, welcome to Plato. And it said, you know, press the next key to begin. If you, when in doubt, press help. And that was it. That was basically the instructions. So I, you know, sat down at a, a empty terminal and looked around on the keyboard and one, and one of the keys was blue and it said next. And that's essentially the return or enter key on a typical keyboard today. They called it next on Plato. And I pressed it and I got this welcome screen with a graphical clock on it and it, and it said to sign in. And um, there were some other instructions in the room that said, you know, if you don't have a what was called a sign-on or, or an account, uh, use demo. Uh, and so I typed in demo and everything. And then I got to these demo menus and you could go listen to music and you could, uh, there were various demonstration programs to show what Plato could do. And I was just completely blown away. And um, I kept going back day after day, week after week. And I discovered there was a whole Plato project, a whole laboratory. There were uh, teams of people and there were even jobs available and you know student programmers and stuff like that and so I in order to get one of those jobs you had to take some of their programming classes which I did um, and all this time I'm discovering things like you know a lot of the people aren't actually working at these terminals they're goofing off they're yakking with people you'd see their fingers flying at the keyboard and then you'd see, you know, that they're, they're actually in an interactive chat with somebody and and uh, a line above them on the screen, someone else, somewhere else on the system, someone is typing really fast and they're having a conversation. And then occasionally someone in the room would break out laughing, you know, and it was like, what the heck is all this stuff? Are, are, you know, and, and I slowly discovered that, you know, in addition to this being an educational system, yeah, you know, this is this is a place where people are actually yakking and communicating and playing games and writing stories and posting in forums and debating politics and talking about television and movies and anything you can imagine. It was all going on. And um, so it really just kind of blew my mind. Now, I'm a freshman in college, and I also took a computer science class. It was like intro to COBOL or Fortran or something. And that was all on punch cards. And I had to do my homework on punch cards. And, but I was already exposed to Plato where they had text editors on screen and you interactively worked on screen and then you could print stuff out. And so the whole notion of using punch cards and then using, uh, and then going back to Plato, it was like, this is nuts. You know, it was so, so jarring. Um, Plato was so far advanced and clearly this was the future. We're talking to programming languages. I mean, while you're on that, I mean, you mentioned about those traditional languages, but Plato kind of going a bit more into the ease of use and how it was designed for users. Um, it actually had a programming language called Tutor 
that allowed right. the users to make their own programs featuring graphics. And obviously with that, I imagine, you know, came the games as well. Right. Uh, and, and, and Tudor is a really interesting story because to computer scientists to this day, you know, if you mention Tudor and they've, they know about it and they've heard about it, um, they will scoff and dismiss it as, as an abomination, essentially. Um, you know, I, I sat down and interviewed Alan Kay at Xerox Park many times for the book, and you know, he he uh, very famously created the Smalltalk language, which is what the uh, the Xerox Park uh, early computers like the Alto and stuff, um, all, all of that stuff was written in Smalltalk, and which is a you know object oriented language, um, so completely different than Tutor. Tutor was. Uh, a fairly primitive programming language from the from the sense from computer science perspective it was kind of inspired by fortran but it it was designed for one specific mission which was to help um, non-technical people be able to create interactive um, lessons and experiences for students on the plato system and so um, uh, things that would be pretty significant chores in another programming language, for example, to just say "hello world" on the screen, um, were a piece of cake in Tutor. You you know if if you wanted to put the word "hello world," you know phrase "hello world" somewhere on the screen, it, it took two lines of code, and um, you could then do all kinds of interesting stuff with it. You could change the size, you could rotate it, you could put it in different text fonts. And there were all kinds of powers like that 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 would have and then, and then of course there was a whole suite of graphics commands to draw circles, lines, squares, you know, filled in areas, all kinds of crazy stuff. And um, in addition, there were tools to um, create uh, bitmap images. And uh, what's interesting there is there was a there was a a, a tool called the Character Set Editor which basically let you design your own text fonts. Uh, Xerox Park saw that. They, they, they were constantly coming over to the Plato project at the University of Illinois from California. And the Illinois people would go out and visit the Xerox people from time to time. So there was a real collegial relationship between the two labs, something that um, has never been documented before my book. I mean, I have a whole chapter about the history of Xerox and Plato, which is really extraordinary um, because Alan Kay actually um, got the idea for the Dynabook, the famous, you know, original idea for the iPad, essentially. Um, he That idea came to him when he saw a demo of a very early prototype of the plasma display at a conference that was held at the University of Illinois in 1968. You know, it, it's, it's just interesting how Someone once described the Plato project as the Forrest Gump of computing, which I thought was hilarious and so apt because, you know, in that movie, he keeps popping up at all these important eras in history, you know, and of course it's all fictional, but, you know, there he is uh, shaking the hands with uh, the president of the United States in the Oval Office and, and, and he's in the Vietnam War and he's in this famous incident and that and all that. And um, Plato was similar in that it kept popping up all over the place in the world of computing, and yet it stayed largely ignored. And um, that in its own right is an interesting story. But, um, you know, getting back to, to the Tudor language was very specifically written for Plato, and it had some interesting capabilities because it was running on a mainframe. Um, there were very simple tools that let you create programs that could share memory with other programs. One of the things that emerged out of that is the ability to to essentially write a game with multiple users in it, um, because you know you could you could have one set of memory that would update the score, for example, and the positions of uh, spaceships or whatever it is in the game or whatever and the status of every player in the game, that that exploded overnight, practically. Um, it, it became kind of a badge of merit to burst into a party somewhere in Champaign-Urbana, Illinois, in the early 70s and say, you know, I have a new game, and check it out. And, and, and your game, it was almost like, you know, the top 40 hits of the week um, 
how many games there were and how they would come and go in terms of popularity. Um, you know, there, there might be some game that everyone played on a Friday night, but by Saturday night, someone else had come out with a competing game that was even cooler and everyone dropped the first game and went to the second. And that went on for years. And um, of course, the only way to create a truly popular game that would stick is to create something that was much more sophisticated and required a lot more work. And, um, and, and that, that, and so that's exactly what happened. Basically, you know, more and more games started emerging that uh, people would spend uh, all nighters living in, whether they were space war games or dungeon and dragon games, you know, uh, and, and again, you know, the, the, the funny thing about the whole Plato story is you typically will find not only early examples of all these kind of, you know, the games that we take for granted today, but they are typically happening years before even the history books talk about early computer games because Plato was so ignored outside of it, of the sphere of people who used it that it never actually got into the history books. And so, you know, you can go to a computer game developer conference or, you know, the history track or something like that, and you'll never hear anything about Plato. And this would go on for years and years and years. Kind of drove me crazy because I, I saw it all and I was a late arrival, you know, showing up in 1979 on Plato that was even past its golden era. Well, there is um, one chapter in the book that I found really fascinating, and that was about the uh, story of a game called Empire. Uh, oh, you know, you yes. mentioned about the, the online gaming there. I mean, you know, I think my first online gaming experience probably wasn't until like Doom in the mid-90s. Um, yeah. But we're going back two decades before that. Now, Empire, um, this was a space game with up to 32 players online at once. And I thought it was interesting that um, Silas Warner was involved in it as well, of course, went on to create Castle Wolfenstein uh, right. in later years too. So um, tell us a bit about Empire and kind of um, how that game worked and your experiences of it. Well, you have to understand, this is, you know, the early 1970s. The people who were drawn to Plato tended to be kind of geeky and nerdy and all that stuff. Um, the Star Trek television show had been off the air for a few years. It went off the air in 1969. Um, at the end of season three, and then it started going into syndication in the early 70s. And so a new generation of, of high school and college kids were completely addicted to Star Trek. And the, the stories I heard of the students of that era, you know, if, for example, if you were an undergrad and you were into Star Trek at the University of Illinois, you would design your course schedule around when Star Trek was doing reruns, even if it was in the middle of the day on the local television station, you know, typically there'd be a Star Trek episode at like four o'clock or three o'clock in the afternoon. And so, you know, everyone would be glued to the TV to watch a rerun of Star Trek. So Trek was everywhere. It was, it was just, uh, just part of the culture. And so that got reflected in some of the games and this one game, um, Empire has a very long, interesting sort of evolution. Um, uh, there were really two uh, key people um, behind it, John Dulesky and Silas Warner. And they were both kind of working on different space war games around 73 or so, <clears throat> 73, 74. And um, they collaborated a little bit. They they used uh, Plato's term talk, which was their instant messaging uh, tools, to to talk. And uh, John Dulesky was asking Silas a bunch of questions and everything. I eventually, uh, Silas decided to spin off his version of the game into a different direction, and John Dulesky kind of took it on as a project, and it became known as Empire, and it went through a whole bunch of versions. But there were basically, you know, Federation starships and Romulan ships. And I think originally there were Vulcan ships and uh, Klingon, of course. And uh, all the cool kids played Klingon, of course. You know, you were considered, it was really funny over the years how if you, f if you joined the Federation team, that was considered really, you know, dorky and you know, uh, because you were, you know, people would mock you like you're trying to pretend you're Captain Kirk and all this stuff. <laughs> but of course, if you were a Klingon or Romulan, you know, 
Uh, the Romulans had the most powerful weapons, but the slowest ships. The Klingons and the Federation ships were equally matched. And then there, there was another team called the Orions, who had the weakest weapons, but their ships were the fastest. So there were all these interesting trade-offs. And in terms of game design, it's really fascinating to see the emergence of all the thinking that goes into game design was, was happening with Plato. And you see it in Empire with just in so many different ways where, you know, the player is given a lot of choices. And, you know, s some of these choices pertain to, you know, do you, do you want something faster or do you want something more powerful in terms of weapons to fight opponents? You know, or do you want to be able to scoot around the universe faster or whatever and flee trouble? And so you had to develop different skills depending on which team you joined and which ships you flew and everything. It was so ridiculously addictive empire that people would stay in games all night long until the system shut down around 6 a.m. for for maintenance. And uh, then they would run off to, uh, you know, restaurants and have dinner at 6 a.m., and so you would go to places like Sambo's or Denny's or other places that were all night diners. And it was funny because apparently the restaurants kind of dreaded when the Empire kids would come in because, you know, they would order things like steaks, you know, and, and, and full, huge meals at six in the morning when everyone else they're serving is, you know, sipping on coffee or having bacon and eggs, they would take over big tables and discuss and debrief on all of the games that they had played. There was a great anecdote that I heard from one, one guy who, who was famous in the empire scene at, at Illinois during these years. Uh, they were, it was the Federation team and they were sitting around a huge table and discussing how, they had, had been defending Earth all night long from an onslaught of enemy ships and everything. And they had finally uh, defeated them in a great victory and conquered the universe and all this stuff. And there was an elderly couple sitting at another table. And this little old lady came over, you know, and, and told the group, you know, I, I don't know what you're what what happened specifically, but I just wanted to thank you for saving the Earth, and, you know. <laughs> And they all, of course, all broke out laughing. <laughs> but, um, yeah, it, it was an amazing innovation, that game. And, and that was, you know, it marked one of the high points in terms of, uh, of, of a Plato game. And so if you were ambitious and wanted to create a game that was as popular as Empire, you would really have to work hard because the programming behind that game is a marvel of innovation, really. I mean, they were doing things that no other developers, even the system programmers, were doing with Play-Doh. They made it do things that were really impossible. I mean, you'd have you know, 30 simultaneous players, and they're all uh, uh, fighting and firing off torpedoes and phasers and, and everything. And the amount of calculations you know, that were going on to figure all that stuff out and where all the, the torpedoes were, had they exploded yet, you know, they each had their own timers and they would self-detonate after a certain point. You know, was, there was a ton of, you know, interesting mathematics and trigonometry and calculus going on. And, uh, you know, they made it sing. It was remarkable. And, there, you know, I have a, another chapter uh, about the Dungeon and Dragon games, which were coming up at the same time Empire was coming up. There, There's a whole history there, you know, because of... Tolkien and the Lord of the Rings and the Hobbit and all that stuff, people were familiar with that. But then there was the famous Dungeon and Dragons table game that came out and took over universities in the early 70s. And of course, computer programmers wanted to cre recreate all of that online. And, you know, it's famous that there's a text adventure game called Eve Adventure, you know, where you you get lamp and you, you, you go west and then you encounter snakes or something. And there's all these twisty little passages all alike in a cave and all this stuff with Plato, you had graphics and you could do three dimensional walk through caves and things like that and actually display little monsters and, you know, with fangs and big wings. And, and so the, even the early Plato games were graphical and very interactive. And the most famous dungeon game was called avatar. But when you look at them all collectively, you realize 
that this is where EverQuest comes from and World of Warfare and, you know, Zork and basically everything else. Um, and, you know, Avatar, Empire, all these things are still running on a pretty fully complete Plato system that's available on the internet called cyber1.org, cyber1.org. You know, if people are curious, they can sign up on these systems and, and, and get an account. It's all free. It's totally worth it to see. I mean, some of the original old timers still go in there and there are still people completely addicted to Avatar. Well, and, I was even uh, reading that the first online first person to shoot a game um, probably started on Plato as well, a game called uh, Spasm by Jim Bowery. Right, right. Yeah. And that, that, was an, that was just a phenomenal game because it was really three-dimensional and it, and it rendered stuff in three dimensions. It was very slow because you know the the bandwidth to uh, send data back to the terminal display from the central mainframe, which was a you know control data cyber supercomputer, literally it was a 6400. You know it was only like 1200 baud modem equivalent, and so to dr- everything was basically drawn as lines. If you saw a planet out there or or something like that, you'd see a circle, and as you approached it, it got bigger and that kind of thing. And it did all the calculations correctly, so it really felt like 3D. It is uh, there. There was even a game called Future War, which um, is remarkable in that it's kind of like a first-person shooter game that eerily is reminiscent of parts of Doom and other games that would come out years later. And um, there's always been some suspicion among many Plato game developers that their ideas would be directly lifted into the PC gaming world. And, uh, you know, I, I went and tracked down, you know, the authors of these games, including uh, Carmack and all those guys who built Doom. They will admit they knew about Plato and that, you know, occasionally you'll hear that uh, there were Plato terminals in some of these game d- development companies. You know, Atari had Plato terminals. It's an unsolved mystery how coincidental certain aspects of much later games showed up on Plato 25 years or 20 or something like that beforehand. Well, there is one really funny chapter of your book <laughs> talking about um, Empire, kind of following on from that. I mean, you said it was based on Star Trek and Leonard Nimoy, Spock, actually right. got to see Empire and uh, and Plato. So what happened there is, uh, you know, after Star Trek, um, Nimoy was kind of typecast and had difficulty getting other roles and uh, because he was so immediately, the only thing missing were the pointed ears. And, um, but, you know, Nimoy was Spock and he hated it. And so he decided to go and do stage uh, acting for a long time. And he went around the country and did all kinds of roles. Um, One flew over the cuckoo's nest and, you know, uh, all kinds of famous Broadway shows and everything. And he typically was the star, of course. And, you know, he wanted to show that he's a real actor and that, that the you know, because the Star Trek thing had just really kind of ruined his career in a way. In 1974, he happened to be playing uh, the lead role in One Flew Over the Cuckoo's Nest at a tiny little but very popular theater in a tiny town in the middle of nowhere in central Illinois. And it was about an hour away from Champaign-Urbana. And so, you know, since Champaign-Urbana was the biggest town around, one day uh, to promote his new play, he came and did a media day with, you know, meeting with television and reporters and things like that. Somehow, the University of Illinois and the Plato Lab heard that he was in town. And so that got added to his itinerary. So he was invited to come and get a tour of what was called the Computer-Based Education Research Lab, which was this funky brick old building, which was the birthplace and home of Plato. And uh, he got a tour of, uh, of the different floors of the building and was invited up to the penthouse where all the cool kids hung out. And that's where they uh, did music programming and of course, everyone had a terminal on their desk, and they showed Nimoy Empire and uh, three-dimensional chess. You know, and, and and what was really funny, I I spoke to a lot of people who remember the uh, Leonard Nimoy visit. I would be bringing it up 
to these people who had not heard about it for 30 or 40 years. And the first thing they would tell me is like, oh, he was drunk or he, he smelled of alcohol. And even Don Bitzer remembered it, it that way. It was, it, was, it was really funny. That was the first thing he thought too, when, you know. And so if you were a diehard Star Trek fan and you were 17 or 18 years old and in walks Leonard Nimoy to your office at, at the Plato Lab, you know, first of all, you're in complete awe, but then you're in shock because he doesn't have his ears. He's not wearing his Federation, you know, blue and black uniform. He doesn't have the boots on, you know, and, and all the rest. He doesn't have the weird haircut. And um, it's it's not Spock, but it is. And here was Leonard Nimoy with a scruffy beard, wearing glasses, and just a regular guy. And um, so that kind of drove the Plato people crazy. And then they discovered he confessed when they showed him this gorgeous chess game that that was on full graphics of, you know, there, there were knights and rooks and kings and queens and pawns, and it was all graphically rendered. And you could play against the computer, and the computer was wicked smart. Lin Nimoy looked at it, and it's like, you know, he had to confess that he didn't know how to play chess. And that just devastated the Star Trek fans in the room because, you know, you're Spock. You're, you, you're like the greatest chess player of all. You, so it was this gigantic disconnect between the fans and the actor. And it was just really, really funny. I tried for years to interview Leonard Nimoy, but his uh, agents and his protectors wouldn't let me get near him. And I, 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 I you know, I, it, it's too bad because I, I think he would have probably been very charming and, and been amused by hearing about what the effect was on all those students back then. It's interesting that within months of that event, he came out with a book called I Am Not Spock. That was his autobiography. And, uh, and then years later, he relented and came out with a second book called I Am Spock. And he kind of decided that, you know, it was okay after all. I think it was after he he had success back in the Star Trek movie series. So you know, in the end, everything worked out. But it, it was it was a remarkable uh, event. Um, there were other famous people that would come through the Plato Lab, like uh, half of the comedy act uh, Fire Sign Theater, which was all the rage in colleges in the '60s and '70s. Um, uh, two of them showed up and got a tour of Plato. And, uh, you know, there were dignitaries and governors and, and, you know, mayors and all kinds of elected officials and executives and entire entourages, busloads of Japanese um, engineers and scientists would come through and take photos of everything they'd see um, to take it back to Japan and try to, to replicate it. And in fact, it was Japan that made the plasma television uh, possible. They're the ones who came you know, Fujitsu came out with the plasma vision in the nineties and then Panasonic and everybody else started creating plasma televisions. And that those were based on the same patents that uh, the Plato people had created way, way back in the uh, mid sixties. So, you know, Plato had all kinds of influence, both in hardware and software and everything. And yet, all of that got almost lost to history. And I felt like it was almost a mission that I had to try uh, as best I could to capture as much as I could and get it in, into a book before all these people died off, you know, were left with a mythology that is largely Silicon Valley centric, but largely inaccurate. And, you know, I felt that that was important to try to, to set the record straight. If you think about it, there are probably 20 or 30 or 40 books written about Steve Jobs, Wozniak, and the founding of Apple, and an equivalent number of books on Microsoft and Google and Facebook and Xerox Park and anything from Silicon Valley and uh, Hewlett Packard and all that. And my hope is that, you know, someday there will be a bookshelf full of Plato related books as well. We need Plato the movie next, I think. Yeah, absolutely. You know, it's funny. I I did actually write the book um, in such a way, you know, it, it's something like 28 chapters or whatever. And I was thinking it could be a mini series of like 26 episodes. Mm. 
because each chapter is very episodic and uh, you know, there, there's so much, we're talking about almost 50 years of history with Plato. People don't realize, you know, it, it started in 1960. And in fact, the, the, the first chapter of the book doesn't even talk about Plato. It talks about what led to Plato before that with B.F. Skinner and all kinds of experiments, um, uh, you know, with teaching machines and stuff like that. And the going all the way back to the, well, the twenties, but then largely the 1950s with Skinner. I mean, it's a vast, vast history. You know, I, I know another author who's working on a book called teaching machines, um, Audrey waters and uh, shout out to Audrey and her new book, it's not out yet, but uh, I believe it's going to be called Teaching Machines, and and it will go into a lot more history about the very early days, um, what essentially has become called educational technology, of which technically Plato was a, a very large part. Um, arguably, there were capabilities on Plato that still haven't been replicated, even in the li- very latest stuff today. And um, so, you know, it's another reason why it was important to try to save some of the history before it all got lost. Well, just before we wrap up, Brian, I mean, we talked about, you know, the, the, the cyber culture on Plato and the gaming as well and the, you know, the online aspect of it. But there's one other thing that I thought was just revolutionary. And I mean, even today, we're, we're just kind of seeing it now, like with the, the slow demise of local newspapers, that kind of everything's moving online. But we, we trace back to Plato and it actually had online newspapers, um, a paper called News Report, that right. even had crowdsourced journalism and even online advertising they were talking about well, as well. Well, they, they were talking about it yeah. for sure. They wanted to do it, but this was a university and their uh, resources were very precious. And when they, when, when the powers that be heard that the students that were running News Report wanted to sell ads on it, they shot that down real fast. But yeah, it, uh, News Report is absolutely remarkable. I have not been able to find an earlier example of a genuine newspaper that was built specifically for being online. There were um, video tech services um, emerging in the 70s, both in the UK and in France, like Minitel, and they typically had news wires on them, and so there would be headlines and stuff like that. Uh, News report was kind of different because it was a mixture of uh, original reporting about what was going on at the University of Illinois, as well as commentary that was all original uh, articles um, by students and by the editors who ran News Report. Um, and, uh, you know, they, they even at one point went to the campus police to request press passes so that they could get into all the various events like, you know, concerts and other events where their press would be gathered in a special section and have special access. And the cops were going, so wait, your, your newspaper is on a computer, you know, and, and uh, they, they of course didn't believe it and told them to get lost and everything. But, you know, they, they tried, they were so ahead of everybody with that news report, you know, um, people would log in every day at around eight or nine in the morning just to see what was new on news report. And um, when Bitzer and his entourage would travel all over the world to demonstrate Plato, like in Moscow, in the middle of the Cold War in 1973 or 74 or 75, they might they, they even went to Iran um, with and demoed you know to the Shah's uh, government and stuff. I mean, they were all over the world. They would tune into News Report to see what was going on in the world because. Typically in these countries, um, there was no Western news. You could not, especially in Moscow, there there was a total blackout of what was going on in the world. And it was only through Plato that the 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 Bitzer and company discovered that uh, the latest news about the Watergate, you know, there was the 18 minute gap in 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 the in the tapes of the White House uh, Nixon tapes was gigantic news while they were demoing in Moscow, and they they would have never known that. Of course, the KGB was listening in on the Plato phone lines that were going back to Illinois. And so that would cause havoc to the modems or whatever, because, you know, the KGB were listening in thinking that there was there were voices going to be heard with this magical Plato computer, you know, 
it, it was all very spooky. Um, it would make a great movie. <laughs> <laughs> well, Brian, I could easily talk to you for another four or five hours about Plato. It's such a fascinating story. And as you mentioned before, I mean, if anyone wants to try it out, I've been having a little play with their Cyber One, which is a um, a resurrection of Plato running on a, an open source emulator that anyone can try out and right. um, you know try some of the old games and check out the community. So I'll put a link to that in our show notes. And uh, your book as well, The Friend, The Orange Glow, available from Amazon and at uh, your website too. All the links will be in the show notes. Um, I just want to say thank you for uh, for covering this history. I mean, someone that's like me that's been into computers all my life, you know, learning something like this that was so revolutionary that was, like you say in the book, a real untold story. I think it's just so important that you put it down on paper. Yeah, and it took a long time. I mean, uh, you know, uh, I, I once did the math. It, it took basically 11 years of work to actually do the interviews, transcribe 7 million words of, of recorded interviews and write the book. Uh, and I did that across 32 years. Cause I mean, this was not my full-time thing. I was, you know, doing startup companies and working at various tech companies and stuff. But over all those years, I managed to track down, you know, the, the, the majority of the key Plato people and interview them sometimes uh, traveling all over the country. And uh, yeah, it was, a, it was a real labor of love, but uh, you know, it, it was the only way to get the story because nothing had been written about it. There were no films, no documentaries, no TV shows, no real you know, uh, mainstream interest magazines or profiles. It was a total wasteland. So the only way to get the story was to interview people. I, I don't look forward to doing another book of that scale. <laughs> <laughs> well, it was well worth it. Um, and like I said, I'll put a link in our show notes. I encourage everyone that's enjoyed this interview to check the book out. Brian, thank you so much for being our guest on the show this week. It's been fascinating talking to you. Well, I, I appreciate the invite and uh, it's been it's been a pleasure. Thank you. Thank you.